rounds to listen, a conversation about leadership and public policy, and the skill of bridging divides through dialogue. I'm very excited today to welcome Bo So, a, a two-time debate champion, a coach for the Australian and Harvard debate teams, a, an author of a fantastic book called Good Arguments, a journalist, a law student, an inspiration <laughs> for many about how to have better dialogue and how to disagree more effectively. So it's really a joy to, to be with you today. Welcome to Charlottesville. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for your hospitality and thank you for having me on the show, Dean. Yeah, so I'm really excited to, to talk to, to, to Bo because you, people come to you for advice all the time about how to debate, how to listen better, how to talk better, how to be more persuasive. But understanding your background, that's not how you started off necessarily as a person confident in all those strategies. Tell me about your journey into this work and maybe even start as, as a child when you first um, immigrated to, to Australia. It's quite true. Um, and in as much as people do come to me for advice, it must be some karmic payback for the amount of time <laughs> I've had to ask for help over my life. Uh, that started when I was eight. I moved from South Korea to Australia without speaking the English language. And I learned that the hardest part of doing that is adjusting to real life conversation and that of those real life conversations, the hardest conversations were disagreements. Part of that was the language. I think we do become less precise when we're disagreeing, when the passions mm -hmm. are running. Mm -hmm. But it was also a sense that I had as one of a handful of Asian kids at the school and the neighborhood that drawing attention to my differences when getting a foothold of belonging was the imperative of the day, it was a family imperative, it was the project, um, that it would be counterproductive, if not dangerous, to draw attention to the ways in which I was different from other people. And the combination of those two things made me resolve to be very agreeable, mm. to smile and nod and get along and um, keep most of my thoughts to myself. And you think when you do that, you're going to hold the thoughts in your mind and then unfurl in the evening, tell your parents around the dinner table. You actually forget <laughs> after a while. Do so you let go of the disagreements in your mind? I think so. And you uh, lose touch with that side of you that had a strong reaction. Right? And so it was a kind of a lonely um, and alienated mm. period in my life. Mm. And, uh, and did you have siblings who you would argue with? The only child, okay. only child. Um, I did have, you know, I'm, I'm an only child and, and, and my family migrated together. And so there was a sense in which we reached the point of parity earlier than I think most parents and children do. There was a sense in which we were all in it together trying to figure out our surrounds. And um, there was a, a refuge in the home where I had the ability to disagree with family members. And so it was a difficult few years for me. Mm. And the thing that changed all that and what broke me out of what had been by that time a posture of conflict aversion that I'd become pretty comfortable in was in grade five. And it was a promise that my teacher made me, mm. which was that on the debate team, when one person speaks, no one else does. <laughs> and to someone who had been spoken over and interrupted and felt like he didn't have a voice, that promise of silence, of patience, of peace, um, it was pretty irresistible. And so that was the beginning of all this talking. <laughs> and I'm still doing it today. And that posture of conflict aversion. I, I, love, that. I love that phrase. Did that change to be a conflict, a posture of perhaps just patience, patience between different sides in a conflict? Or how, how do you think about your work now? Or what's your posture now in conversation? That's such a wonderful question. I mean, I, I like the framing of it as a posture because it's instinctive, right? And it's also changeable. And it's changeable. 
um, doing yoga these days, so I have to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll touch my, uh, stretch my hamstrings. At a little some bit point. at a time. <laughs> um, and in as much as it's a kind of instinct, it's a way of moving through the world. It's a defensive one, right? It's a, it's one that keeps people at an arm's length because you believe they have the capacity to hurt you. It's also uh, a defensive one from aspects of yourself that are inconvenient. Mm. Right? So um, it's at once disconnected from the world, but also disconnected from the self. Just a disequilibrium in a way. I think that's anyone. right. I think it's a very thin kind of a life, you know, mm. one that tries to walk a wire at all times. You don't lean too far on either side. You try not to offend. And nowadays, um, you know, I, I still am a pretty shy person. So I'm, that posture is familiar enough to me. And I find myself, um, especially with a lot of the ugliness that's going on in the world, where the costs of public disagreement in particular can feel mm -hmm. so costly, find myself getting back into that pose, getting reacquainted with that pose. But at my best, the times when I feel like I'm being uh, most engaged with the world, most fully myself, I'm a lot more open. And that's a posture in which you can get hurt. You can have difficult conversations, but you do it because that's the cost of belonging more fully to the world. So one of the things about as a fifth grader, when your, when your teacher invited you to, to join debate, was this notion that the other side will have to listen to you speak. My guess is in the real world and, and, the, times that, and the times we face now, people are not quiet while you're making your arguments. And they often are, have a posture of not wanting even to let your ideas in. How, what advice do you give to people in those sorts of conversations? Or how do you personally take it knowing that the other side's not going to listen quietly while you make your carefully crafted arguments. Yeah. I think the first bit of advice is not to rush into the disagreement. Mm. And one of the things that my teacher was doing was, rather than saying, disagree or raise your voice or say your piece, she was having a conversation with me about the conversation. She was saying, this is what it's going to be like. And all those rules, which feel very basic, we're going to take turns so you don't have to interrupt. We're going to be given roughly equal time in which to speak. So we're going to have some equality um, of opportunity to be heard. Those rules can be incredibly powerful. Right? So the first is have a conversation about the conversation, agree to some ground rules. And I think maybe the second thing is pay attention to the acoustics of the room in which you're going to have the disagreement, right? So what stood out in your description of a space where there's a lot of talking and not a lot of listening are online spaces in particular, mm -hmm. where the very setup is designed to promote the most incendiary kind of invectives, really. Um, and so you have to find a space. It might look like this, <laughs> light filtering it, but, but more so uh, uh, trying to find those moments face to face where you're going to be able to give the ideas some room in which to breathe. And the first step, it sounds like, is to try to find some agreement about the conversation itself. Absolutely. That's about how we're going to have the conversation. It's also about what it is that we're disagreeing about. Right? So we've all been in these conversations that start out about one thing. It's about the dirty laundry or who forgot to take out the trash and just accumulates. Right. And you, <laughs> all, forget, and you may forget what even the original disagreement was. Precisely. And, w and what a tragedy that is because what we do remember is the hurt and the pain and mm. uh, maybe the even lasting wound to our relationship. So naming the disagreement, saying this is what it is that we're disagreeing about is another way of saying this is not what we're disagreeing about. Right? So when we say we're really disagreeing about the trash here, not on the table is whether we're going to continue to live together, whether we love each other. I think that level of um, clarity 
keeping one foot in the conversation, but another foot out of it. Mm. So you're observing yourself, you're mm. seeing how am I not only as a party to this disagreement, but as someone who's building a conversation together, that kind of uh, external view and the ability to track how a conversation is going, right. I think that can be helpful. In, in negotiation classes, sometimes that's referred to as go up to the balcony. Yeah. Right. And look down at the fight down on the, in the arena, but you be have at least one foot up in the balcony so you can have some distance as you reflect. That's upon. right. And, you know, it's a, it's a very funny feature of competitive debating, mm -hmm. which is a tradition I come from that uh, you want to win, but you actually don't want to win in a, uh, in a complete landslide because there's no sport in it. You want the other side to be there, right there with you, challenging. That's how you push forward your ideas. Mm. Um, and at the end of an hour or so, you want to say, in addition to having one, because it's a competitive activity, that you built something together. And I think that's what a conversation can be. So you, you, you got into debate young. Were you, did you start off as an expert and did you start off, you know, with brilliant skills or did you start off losing a lot? And, that, and how, did, how did you learn the process? Most debaters lose a lot, right? So the world championships has 500 teams. It has one winner. And so in all likelihood, you're going to be in the 499. And that was especially so if you were me. <laughs> <laughs> uncertain in language, shy. Um, I was not the kid who was most likely to pick up his hand in class or to crack a joke or to call attention to myself. And so it went against my instincts in some way. But it must have fulfilled some need that I had mm. to be heard not only in agreement, but in disagreement, in showing myself more fully, right? in engaging with conversation with people who I thought were different from me, engaging in conversation in a society that I wasn't sure was going to accept me. Right? It was a pretty deep psychological <laughs> set of needs. But you often in debate don't get to choose the side you're arguing, right? And I assume in some of those cases you were they've been taking positions that you disagreed with. Absolutely. Um, and I'll say two things about that. So one is there was a huge amount of psychological freedom, right? In being able to enter into a discussion saying, I don't fully commit to this, but I'm going to make the best advocates argument that I can. And at the end of it, we'll see what we think. That was one part of it that uh, was useful for me that helped unsettle even some of the strongest convictions I held mm. that for this hour, I have permission to try on something else. It separates the ego from the position. So there's a playfulness mm. associated mm. with that. Um, and the other thing that, that you learn in separating the position that you're arguing for and the skills that you bring to bear is that sometimes you can be right and less persuasive on the day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can be wrong and you can be more persuasive. Mm -hmm. And there are problems with that, of course. And, and maybe we want the two things to go together um, more often than they do. But the upside of that disconnect is you see that argument is a skill. And you also use that in preparation. I've heard you talk about side switching and exercises that one can do to kind of, you know, better prepare for an upcoming debate. Can you explain that? I found that fascinating. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I heard a lot when I felt that distance between me and my peers is to exercise empathy, just try and be empathetic. And this was a very puzzling kind of instruction because I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> Right? And it's not clear whether empathy is a, sometimes it feels like a psychic connection that magically happens when you're sitting down. Sometimes it feels like a virtue that you mm. possess. And the thing that made it click for me was a skill that I learned in debate, which is called side switching, which comes from the fact that you know there's going to be opposition to your side. Right? And you know... By design. I mean, that, that, that... By design. It's required. It's the other person's duty to do it. 
And you know, once they've disagreed with you, you're going to have to improve your original position to overcome that objection. And it doesn't take too many steps after that to say, well, you might as well do that ahead of time. So try and anticipate where they're going to come from and see if you can preempt that. So side switch is a set of exercises that debaters do just before they go on the stage, which is once they've come up with the best arguments for their side, they try and come up with the best arguments for the other position. Or they go through what they've prepared as if through the eyes of someone who fervently disagrees and try to come up with as many holes or problems as you can and then you try and overcome it. And, you know, critical thinking is a lot of things, but some part of it are exercises like these, I think, knowing that you may be wrong. Yours may be the view that needs to be accommodated or changed, mm. revised. And going through those exercises, I think, gets us unstuck from our certainty in a way that allows something like empathy to come forward. I sometimes wonder whether debate, rather than bringing us closer together and closer to the truth, is just about you know competition or in some some even call debate a very aggressive activity. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you know, do you think debate is a good way for us to advance the search for truth and build community, or is it uh, should we actually avoid disagreement and and avoid the debate context? Those are very important concerns, and and uh, and I have them myself, right? And the event that crystallized that for me was so I won the World Debate Championships in January 2016, height of my feelings towards debate, probably self-regard too. <laughs> what happens several months after that is the presidential election cycle between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, where you remember the debates were not only a symbol of the polarization that had driven this country, but right. became a tool by which it became worse. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's powerful. What do yeah. I do about that? Right. Given that I've I've lived my life in such a way that um, debate that I've become a kind of testament for what debate could do for a person. So what do I do about that? And I think I had two reflections, right, in the aftermath of those sets of debates. The first is, um, debate and its ability to be a force for good is limited when it's the only mode of disagreement we have. Right? So I believe debate for some of the reasons that you suggested, that it's, uh, contestation, that it's exciting, it's both destructive and generative. For all of these reasons, it has incredible capacities to generate ideas, to force us to account for one another because I have to respond to you. I can't just take that on notice. Right? But <clears throat> one thing that I think even children understand instinctively about debate is that it has to end at some point. <laughs> right? So after the hour, you have to switch to a new mode of speaking to one another, perhaps reflecting on what the disagreement was about, right? perhaps reflecting on some of the ideas that came. And it can set the table for something like a negotiation, which you brought up earlier. So the ability to view debate as one language of disagreement, but not the only one that we need, I think is helpful, and letting it end. And I think that's what we don't see enough of. Right. When you switch on cable television, when you look at partisans and ideologues arguing against one another, it's an unending debate. <laughs> and for me, as a debater, even that sounds like a kind of a purgatory. <laughs> and I think if we take your, the notion of creating a little distance, mm. one can see a debate as really a contest of ideas, not a battle of virtues between two different debaters. That's wonderful. Um, and, and one thing that has helped me with that is seeing just how little the winning or losing of a particular round has to do 
with the value of the activity. Right? So one mental switch that I had to make just because I was losing a lot was saying, well, why am I here again the following week? Hmm. Right? And I think the reason is um, there are many ways to win from a disagreement. Right? You can fail to persuade the other side, but learn something about the world, learn something about yourself, simply be heard. And so having that more expansive view of what winning and losing can entail in disagreement, um, that has helped me. So we're, we are here in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia. You've come at a really great time. We have this Democracy 360 conference with experts from around the world here talking about the challenges of our democracy. One of those challenges is the issue of polarization. And you know, you've reportedly said that the problem of polarization isn't so much that we disagree, but that we disagree badly. What does good disagreement look like? A good disagreement is one in which both sides walk away and they say, I would do that again. Right. And so it's a game you're willing to keep playing or it's, right. it's a country you're willing to keep committing to. That's right. It took me a little while to get to that answer because um, the book I wrote is called Good Arguments, right? And so people say, what's a good argument? And, and you want, as a salesman, to say, it's going to change your life, it's going to get you a raise, <laughs> and all of those things. But um, I'm happy with that baseline. It's both sides walking away, thinking they would do that again. That's all it takes for the conversation to continue, right? And as your uh, question suggested, um, the ability of people to say that is important, not just in debate. Um, it's important in democracy. It is contestation. It's disagreement. It's difference. But as long as people are willing to say, I'm going to win sometimes, I'm going to lose sometimes, in elections, in contests, in the daily battles that we have, but I'm willing to come back, that I'm okay with the rules by which we're playing the game, that they keep in mind the sportsmanship as well as the gamesmanship of it. Mm -hmm. um, and respect those rules and protect those rules. Absolutely. Yeah. And be willing to, in addition to disagreeing and, and, and battling, collaborate on those rules too, right? to agree on a set of rules that we can all play by, that we can all endorse. Um, that seems to me a very central challenge that we're gonna have to deal with. Well, your work really is so inspiring. I, I, I think that I'm so glad you'll be speaking um, at the Batten School later today and to Batten students, because I think we all would benefit from the ability to disagree more skillfully, dis disagree better, Remember, to, we want to keep playing this game and continue to, to, to come back to the table again and again because you know, that's how we, I think, strengthen the ties of our common humanity. As we go off into the day, and you know, we'll, whether I'm disagreeing over a parking spot or, or someone <laughs> on the street, are there some either mindsets or, or, or tips you might give um, that we all could apply if the next interaction we might have or the next time we're in a debate? You know, one tool that I would share is um, to be judicious about jumping into disagreement. And um, I like the example you reached for just then because it says something that's very true about our experience of disagreement, which feels like we're always hurtling into it. It doesn't, it never feels like, okay, calm, measured, we're entering into it. It feels like we've already begun by the time we register that that's the mode in which we are. And um, one of the tools that I had to learn after having learned to debate, and when you're holding a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail, right? Um, is to, to choose my battles. Mm. And one of the things that I write about is to ask yourself four questions to see whether the conditions are there for a good disagreement at, at all. And this is called the RISA checklist. It's to ask whether the disagreement between you and the other side is in fact real. It's not a misunderstanding. That it's important enough to justify having the disagreement, 
because disagreement is work, as we've been saying, that the subject of the disagreement is specific enough so that you're going to be able mm. to make some progress on it in the time that you have. And finally, that both sides are aligned in their reasons for wanting to engage in the dispute. And it's not that they're in it for the same reasons necessarily, but you can be okay with the reasons why the other side is engaging in the dispute. They're not just there to hurt your feelings or to call your names or something like that. And so um, taking a minute to ask whether those conditions mm -hmm. are there, speaking about how it is that we're going to have the conversation, it can be as brief as, hey, let's agree not to interrupt. Right? Let's agree to give each other a chance to be heard. Um, that element of being more deliberate about the practice of it, um, I think that can help many disagreements go better. Great advice. So is it real? Is it important? Is it specific? And are we aligned about the purpose? And do we approach that with some judiciousness? That's right. I'm grateful for your wisdom, Boso. Thank you so much for joining. And I uh, hope you have a fab fabulous visit here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Thank you for the opportunity to meet you, Dean, and to be in conversation with your students. I'm excited to get on with the day. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.